The day my mother found out she was dying, she asked me to go out and buy her these glass marbles. Dad and I hadn't even known she was ill, which was nothing new. Whenever you ask my mother if she was ill, she'd throw things at you. Sesame buns, the editorial page, a handful of hair ribbons. Do not, she'd say, suggest things to suggestible people. Anyway, I brought her these marbles and she counted 90 of them out and put them in this old cut glass bowl, which had been the sum total of my great aunt Helena's estate. Apparently, the doctors had given her three months, and she said great story by the doctors. She said she always believed them because they were the nearest thing to the Old Testament we had. I wouldn't give you two bits for those young, smiley guys, she'd say. I'd go for a good, stern furrowed physician. <laughs> she wouldn't even have her teeth cleaned by a dentist under 50. So, I brought her the marbles and she put them in the bowl on her bedside table. Then she went out and spent $1,200 on nightgowns. She said, in my family, you aren't dying unless you take to your bed. And that, my darlings, is where I'm going. And she did. <laughs> oh, we hashed it around. <laughs> Dad said she couldn't possibly be dying but the doctors convinced him. I told her it seemed a little medieval to just lie up there in state, but she said she didn't want to be distracted from what she loved, us, and what she wanted to mow. Then she said there was nothing inside except for drugstores, supermarkets, and dry cleaners, and that given a the situation, they were beneath her dignity. <laughs> so, I asked her what she intended to do up there, and she said, study French, visit with us, generally mull, and maybe call a few pals. Study French. <laughs> she said she'd made a pledge to herself years ago that she would die bilingual. Dad and I cried a lot. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> it was fun to cry with. <laughs> From then on, the doctor had to come and see her. Because as she put it, she came in with the house call and she was going to go out with the house call. <laughs> and all day, every day, she'd hold one of these marbles in her hand. She said it made the days longer. Mother had her own bedroom. That's the way it had always been for as long as I can remember. <laughs> she called my father the thrasher. Oh, he could really get into a nightmare. Apparently early on in the marriage, he'd flipped over and broke her nose and that was it. Separate beds. <laughs> The room was very spare, really. An old steel brass bed, oak dresser, a bedside table, and don't ask me why, a hat rack. <laughs> no pictures on the walls. She never understood how people could look at the same darn thing day after day. She said it was bound to deflate the imagination. We'd sit with her after dinner and talk about issues. She said she was too far gone for gossip or what we ate for lunch. Then we'd all turn in and after a little while, just before I drift off, and hear this. Happened every night. And after the third or fourth day, I saw one on the floor and I started to pick it up and she said, leave it. She said it very sharply. And I asked her, how come? And she said she was learning to let go of them. Oh, she passed the time. <laughs> there were things she wanted. 
She wrote down a list of children's books from her own childhood and we got as many as we could find from the library. She said they were still the only good book she'd ever read. She wrote notes to, I don't know, maybe 60 or 70 people. And they later on told us that they were sort of little formal goodbyes. Each of them recalling some incident or shared something. Not very significant, but the odd thing was that in each one of them, she included a recipe. A recipe in every one of them. We got out the cookie tin full of snapshot that somehow never turned into a scrapbook. She liked that. She showed my father how to do the medical insurance and how she handled the accounts. We went through jewelry. She wrote down the names of the roofers and the plumbers and the air conditioning people. She called it wrapping it up. Well, this is good, she said. I'm wrapping it up. She had the television moved up into her bedroom and she called me aside to say that it was entirely possible for her to reach a stage where she wouldn't really know what she'd be watching. But I must promise her to keep it on PBS. Later on, when things started getting really hard, she told Dad and me that she would like to spend more time alone. I'm afraid, she said, that I'm going to have to do this more or less by myself. She said she was happy and she hoped that we would be, that this was arranged so you'd get less attached to the people you love in the end. The next part, the next part isn't worth going into. It was just hard. <laughs> Do you know that from the very beginning down to the very last, she never admitted to any pain, never. She called it the chills. <laughs> the last thing she asked for was a picture in our front entrance hall of a Labrador retriever she and dad had owned when they first got married. <laughs> he was, she said, a perfectly dreadful doc. When you're young, she said, you believe in the perfectibility of dogs. I was in bed two weeks ago, a Wednesday towards dawn. And then this. When Dad and I ran in there, the bedside table was spilled over and she was gone. Then, when the emergency medical people arrived, they found this. The rest spilled over when the bedside table fell, but this one, this one's still in her hand. I keep it. I keep it in my head all day. It makes the days longer. <laughs>